Hi guys, I'm Dan at VintageFellow.org and today we are in for one big treat. We are going to get out there and ride Jan Ulrich's 2005-2006 series Team Mobile Giant TT bike custom made for him by Valsa Bikes. Um, although it is obviously liveried up as a giant, there's nothing giant about this. Uh, it is completely custom made by Valsa. Now, some of you may have seen this bike already. Last year, uh, the GCN guys, Ollie and Cy, uh, did a video featuring this very bike. Um, it did almost cripple Ollie uh, putting in the efforts because of the extreme position. Um, but I can assure you, um, you know, kudos to those two guys, Ollie and Cy. That was a full on storm. Um, when they were out riding, um, it was near dark, it was chucking down with rain, it was freezing cold and the wind was smashing them all over the place and they still went out and rode a time trial bike with 80 mil TT wheels on there. I would not have done it, I was hiding in a pub nearby uh, refusing to go outside because it was horrible. Um, so you know those guys, wow, I would never have ridden a bike in those conditions. So uh, yeah that was some uh, serious effort by them. Now one thing we did discover in that video was this bike is really fast and really hard to ride fast um, it's because of the extreme um, seat to bar drop uh, to get you in that really low time trial position i hate to say it unless you are like uh, jan ulrich or chris boardman one of those guys who can do these kind of positions and produce the power, I don't think you'll get the best out of this bike um, because it is so extreme. You're almost laying down on this in the band Superman position. It's not far off of that uh, in its geometry, um, but it is very extreme. Now, Jan Ulrich started riding Valsa bikes in 2003 when he's riding for the Bianchi team, um, the one year that he rode them um, before they went down. Now, um, at that point, the, uh, the first style of Valsa TT bike, uh, the brakes up front were actually set behind uh, the front forks, a few other little tweaks. Then in 2004, shift back around, he gets around the front and he gets a bit more of a traditional look. But there are many, many fantastic features um, that are one off on these bikes. And the most notable is the width. These things are really, really narrow. Uh, instead of a regular like 110 mil, 110 mil wide um, bottom bracket shaft, no, these are 75 mil. They've knocked almost 30 mil off the width uh, of the bottom bracket to get that your legs really in nice and narrow. Um, it does affect your QF factor or the Q factor for how wide out your knees get. We'll come to that in just a moment. Um, also at the back here, the dropouts, the spacings, 110 mil wide. Whoa. That caused me a lot of issues, uh, not least because when I got hold of this bike, it was complete apart from the wheels. The wheels were missing. And when you buy or bought one of these Valsas, um, they were exceptionally expensive. The frame set alone, about uh, $10,000 at the time. Um, the wheels are custom made. Uh, the backs were usually uh, a full carbon dish um, and to get over the fact that you've got a 110 mil spacing at the back, they have to ha be made specifically for that offset angle. Uh, it's very, very tight. Um, and it sounds really bodgy, um, but what Valsa actually did, he took a 10 speed cassette, uh, Dura Ace cassette, ground down uh, tenth. Uh, so you only have nine speeds because it, it bangs onto the frame. So there's no frame clearance and then then he narrows the axles and does everything else um, and the problem with that is you can't get them anymore uh, the rear wheels were again special order only at the time when you bought the bike they were two and a half thousand dollars per wheel um, there are not a lot of those not kind of the thing you just go on ebay and buy a new wheel um, so what i did was um, we knew that they would have to be redished we knew we'd have to machine uh, the rear axles um, and play around with the offsets and there is no tolerance no tolerance up front here uh, around the bb area i'll get in close there for you um, it is so so tight 23 mil tires absolute maximum um, and uh, what you have to do at the back yes um, you have to just machine down everything get everything really really tight uh, redish the wheels it's just a big challenge and a big thanks to James at the In Gear Pro Shop in Forest Row. He did the engineering on that one and got it sorted out or else couldn't have been able to ride this bike. Um, 
but other than that it is exactly as it came um, when Yan last rode this in 2006. Um, now, when he started riding these in 2003, um, he was the first guy that really put uh, Lance Armstrong in the Armstrong era under immense pressure. Now, if you remember, if you remember back uh, 2003 Tour de France, uh, one of the first, I think it was the, no, it was the mid uh, time trial, Lance got a bit panicky. Um, Ulrich had gone out just on fire. Um, he absolutely blazed his way through the time trial. Lance went too hard, he got dehydrated, started foaming at the mouth a bit, and he lost loads of time. Um, now, overall, um, he managed to win the tour. I think Ulrich crashed on the final time trial, um, and um, Lance managed to keep hold of the yellow jersey, but it did put the wind up Armstrong. Um, and he went out, or well, one of his team went out, and got hold of one of these valses, which he then practiced on and tried to ride, thinking he might do the same, badge it up as Trek and take it out. Unfortunately, now, it may have been the QF factors. Now, apparently, the Q factor uh, gave him tendonitis in the knees. Um, I'm not sure whether it did or not. I've got a feeling he probably had it set up much like this, tried to replicate the, uh, the power and speed that Ulrich was putting out and his hip angles closed up and I don't think he could make the power. Um, having ridden this and seen a couple of guys riding it, I think it's so extreme that really the geometry just doesn't work for the vast majority of riders. I'd have to ask Lance directly about that one. Um, hey, who knows, maybe one day. Uh, but yeah, very, very narrow, very extreme position, very hard to ride, but it does ride really, really well. Now, good thing is, the sun's come out, I think it's time to get out there and ride. Okay, so today, southeast of England, the sun is shining, but there is quite a bit of wind. Uh, and uh, we're gonna get straight on to talking about this Valsa Giant TT bike of Jan Ulrichs. Uh, now, this is a real Jekyll and Hyde of a bike. Uh, because when you're just cruising along and you're fairly upright, um, it's a brilliant bike, uh, even for a TT bike. Now, if you put a regular stem, like a 120 stem on here, and some 40 centimeter wide bars, uh, and a few more uh, gears or sprockets on the back, this would be an exceptionally nice road bike to ride. The ride quality is superb, the handling is really, really good, even for a TT bike. Um, however, there's a bite in the tail. There is definitely a sting in the tail. When you get down low on those skis, the position is so extreme um, that, as uh, Ollie at GCN said, it's not sustainable. I mean, when he did the uh, about a 7k effort down in the Cotswolds last year, um, that shredded his quads in no time. Uh, for me, last week, I took this out for a bit of a practice run, uh, and uh, I gave it a, a nudge over a 10k uh, time trial course, sorry, 10 mile time trial course, and I ended up before the end uh, with um, calf cramp, uh, but in the shin, so both of my shins cramped up before the end. I've never ever had that before, and I can assure you, shin cramp, is really painful and hard to get away from because I couldn't stretch it out. Uh, now, with that in mind, on today's effort, I'm gonna go at like 90, 95% because when you try and get to 100% power, you start hitting a brick wall. And that's because your position is so far forward. If you are not biogenetically made for it, and by that I would cite the likes of Chris Boardman, or Jan Ulrich, someone along those kind of lines. Graham Obrey, another great example. If your hip angle will not allow you to create full power in such an extreme position, you're probably going to go faster staying a bit more upright. And if I'm honest, if I was blasting this thing out full power upright, I think I'd probably go a little bit faster than I would in the full aerodynamic tuck on the skis. Um, but that is purely because the position is so extreme. I'm also a little bit taller than Yadawick, so I've had to raise the seat up even higher 
uh, to be able to get my legs to kind of work on this, uh, which is even more of a problem because I'm higher and the stem remains as low as it was slammed when all it rode it. on the setup um, now the most obscure comparison reference you're ever likely to hear and probably never likely to need um, although this Dura Ace uh, 7800 is fantastic um, it's really smooth it's really quiet and Cy from GCM was quite right when he said it sounded like a rocket ship when it's going along uh, the wheels do make a really nice humming noise as you go along um, and it does make you feel like you're on something very special. Uh, however, the bar end time trial shifters um, are simply not that good. Um, if you remember last year when I was on the uh, yellow giant Onsei TT bike, now that had 10 speed Campagnolo on there and the change was super clicky, really, really nice, really positive. Um, <coughs> this one, now admittedly it's a nine speed up front um, for obvious reasons explained um, but it's a bit woolly you know it takes a bit of feathering sometimes you just don't get it quite right um, so campy wins out on that one now before we uh, go for the uh, 10 mile TT effort today um, Let's just uh, talk a little bit about Jan Ulrich and this rather fantastic Valser giant bike that Andy Valser made for him. I'll give you the uh, that view there because uh, you know that's the view I see a lot of on this thing, um, and it's quite impressive. Uh, now Ulrich was a child of the collapse of the Eastern Germany Soviet bloc era. Um, and I know, obviously we all know that Ulrich ultimately got to his downfall was the Operation Puerto Affair and doping what via Fuentes, the doctor, the Spanish doctor. But putting that to one side, you have to admire the, uh, the German state system at that point. Um, the Eastern German state system, they were biomechanically testing kids at the age of six. Um, to see who was good at what and if you had potential then they monitored and developed that potential from the age of six and although that sounds a little bit wacky for the uh, for pure results it's the way to do it I mean UK we now do it for about the age of 12 uh, and have done for a number of years um, but uh, when the uh, East Germany and the wall came down and it all collapsed uh, the first thing that a lot of Western countries wanted was the sports scientists and that wasn't just because of doping uh, it was because of all of their techniques and methods that they had nurtured to create an incredible number of champions out of a very small pool of potential athletes and that wasn't just down to doping because that was rife throughout the entire Soviet Union at that point uh, now all we started out as a junior very very good um, if you uh, really need to know about his history I would highly recommend Daniel Freib's uh, book Ulrich um, that uh, is a great source of material uh, and if you really want to delve deep into the character and psyche of Jan Ulrich that's pretty much a very good place to start um, but yeah a very very gifted amateur he's winning tons of stuff it's quite obvious he's going to go all the way from a young age uh, which he does and then obviously he bursts uh, into the real prominence oh let me just turn this around that's better i've got some road again uh, now the the time we really get to see Ulrich shine uh, is in the 1996 tour de france where he's technically riding as a domestique to Biana Rees. Uh, Rees goes on to win that year, uh, but uh, it's quite clear that Ulrich uh, is the star of the show. Um, and then in 1997, they return to the tour. Ulrich's in devastating condition. Uh, 
Biana Reese less so. Technically, Biana Reese starts out as number one rider, but very rapidly it's clear that Ulrich's the man. And uh, Ulrich goes on to take a convincing podium win uh, at the uh, 97 Tour. Now, then it gets interesting. Um, obviously, 98, uh, the famous Pantani Giro Tour double uh, and Giro bests him on the Galibier and uh, the other mountain finishes. Fantastic. You should definitely YouTube that if you get a chance. However, 1997, bizarre thing happens to Ulrich. Um, he, as soon as he's won the tour, the man starts eating. And I mean eating. Um, I mean, Lance Armstrong used to say things like, you know, that performance was not normal. And uh, that was normally in reference to drug use. Um, but I think for Jan, his eating was not normal. There are many accounts of him going to the breakfast bar three, four, five times just for breakfast and then going out and riding. And basically, Jan turned from a riding machine into fat Jan. Um, and he really slapped it on. And then ultimately, every year it was a race for him, not in a race, but a race for him to try and get into condition. And he would hide away in the Black Forest uh, in uh, Germany and he would be trying to lose those kilos that he put on. I mean, we're talking kilos and kilos. Would never happen now. Um, but yeah, he really put it on. And ultimately, he was almost in a battle for himself. Um, again, quoting Lance Armstrong. Um, Armstrong used to say that Ulrich was the guy that got him out of bed, that motivated him to train, to get him to push harder. And he always said that if Ulrich ever got his together, then Ulrich would just be unbeatable. Uh, and ultimately, that's how it would be. But he, uh, you know, he becomes the ultimate second, a bit like Pugliador, um, to uh, Lance Armstrong. Um, and uh, he never again gets to grace the first place at the Tour de France. He wins other races, notably Tour de Suisse, things like that, and lots of stages, but he doesn't carry on to win. And in fact, uh, in 2005, he's starting to get it together. And in 2006, when Lance has quit, and everyone then really notches up a gear, and Ulrich's coming back strong. And in fact, on this very bike, he destroys all at the Tour de Suisse um, to uh, take the overall victory um, of that stage race. And when he's getting ready for the Tour, um, his condition he describes as La Bomba. He is the bomb, he is ready to go. And then several days before the Tour, Operation Puerto comes out and uh, yeah, he's banned from the Tour, he's withdrawn, he retires the following year, there's no coming back from that. Um, which was a shame in some ways, obviously, because he didn't get to race when he was back in total form. On the other hand, yep, we know what he was doing, so he shouldn't have been racing. Uh, but there we go, that's the potted history of Jan Ulrich. Um, post riding, um, it is quite a sad tale. We're looking at um, a spiral of depression, uh, drug use, um, reclusion, uh, issues, um, police arrests. And in fact, at one point, irrespective of what you may or may not think of Lance Armstrong, Armstrong personally intervenes, flies, I think it was to Spain, where Jan Ulrich was living at the point, and uh, escorts him to a plane back to the Betty Ford Clinic to dry him out, to clean him up, because it's a one-way spiral. And Ar Lance Armstrong can see that. And Lance, genuinely loves the guy and you know we all know as, or think of Armstrong as the brutal Texan um, but you know his interventions direct interventions with Jan Ulrich uh, which he didn't publicize you know I only found out about it reading uh, uh, for this uh, for this video and you just realize then that he's not as bad as he's made out uh, certainly but I wouldn't have liked to have ride it written against him but uh, yeah Ulrich's only here, probably because of Armstrong. Now, I found a much better TT route uh, to try today. Um, 
if you remember last year's uh, yellow on say TT bike route we did uh, that was truly dangerous to the point uh, that I thought I might die um, whereas today this is a much more of a back roady route quite flat um, I've ridden this one before so we'll give this a go see what happens as I mentioned I'm aiming to hold about 90-95% power I don't want to hit 100% for the route because I do not want my shins to cramp up again like they did last week anyway let's get see how this one goes start that and in GCN tradition beep 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 now straight away now pretty quickly uh, I do notice this wind um, is definitely buffeting me and catching that front wheel um, I mean it's not dangerous but I'm glad there's not lots of traffic and I have no idea how Cy and Ollie rode this thing in a storm okay into the wind now um, legs are hurting, quads are hurting buttocks are hurting uh, as ever with a TT effort it's an exercise in pain hey guys Okay, I'm with the wind now. This thing's really fast, like really, really fast. But my quads are hurting. Shin so far, okay. But my quads and butt are definitely tight. Well, that's the end of uh, today's TT effort, as ever. Uh, more of a, an experience of pain than uh, an enjoyable ride. Um, the bike there, yeah, it rode superbly. Um, just a shade into the 23 minutes uh, for the 10 mile classic uh, British TT route. Um, no doubt that bike would be an awful lot faster um, if I was a little bit shorter uh, and could actually produce power in that extreme aerodynamic position which to be fair I can't my legs hurt uh, my back hurts my butt hurts uh, my neck hurts uh, fortunately no cramp in the calves at this time oh sorry the shins um, but other than that yeah it's a lot of pain and I think that's ultimately what this bike comes down to um, it's an incredible bike to ride it's incredibly well built uh, it weighs in at uh, just over eight kilos I'll put the uh, the weight in about here for you because I've forgotten what it is offhand um, and it's it rides really well it straight it tracks very straight it corners nicely um, it handles crosswinds pretty well I mean you get a little knock when it catches those 80 mil um, uh, wheels on there um, but uh, uh, the 80 mil zips yeah you do get a little knock but other than that it's very very good and certainly when you compare it directly with like that on say uh, aluminium giant TCR TT bike that we rode uh, last year that definitely had that bit of like shed homemade kind of feel to it with the extra fillets welded into the uh, the framework and things like that this is in a totally different league um it's incredibly well built um and the engineering that's gone into it is off the chart um but yeah i can see why lance didn't really get on with it um it's very very extreme and unless you are someone like jan ulrich and unless you are exceptionally flexible, well, don't get me wrong, I did lots of extra stretching and yoga this week. Remember the yoga video we did last year that hardly any of you watched? Yep, lots of that was done. Um, but yeah, still a tough bike to ride. Uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, do like and subscribe for anything that's cool to do with bikes and uh, we'll catch you up.